Scientists recently measured the shortest time ever, 247 zeptoseconds, where a zeptosecond is one trillionth of a billionth of a second. To put that in perspective, in the time it takes light to travel 30 centimeters, one trillion zeptoseconds has passed. This is a significant improvement on measurements by femtosecond spectroscopy, which won the 1999 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. So, how do they achieve such an amazing feat? To begin with, we should briefly discuss the history of measuring time in general. We have gone from using sundials that just use the position of the sun to tell the time, to mechanically driven clocks that use the motion of pendulums to keep track of time, to more recently, much more advanced quartz crystal clocks, where a voltage is applied to a quartz crystal, which causes it to oscillate, and this oscillation frequency defines the time. And finally, we moved on to atomic clocks, which uses measurements of the atomic transitions to define the time. In fact, atomic clocks are incredibly accurate and stable to within one second for millions to billions of years. We use atomic clocks to define how long a second is, which is defined as 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to a specific cesium atom transition. But these latest measurements are in another league altogether. One period of the same radiation that defines a second it would take 109 billion zeptoseconds. In order to measure such an incredibly small unit of time, scientists from Germany used a few things. A synchrotron to produce X-ray radiation, hydrogen molecules, and a little quantum mechanics. So let's unpack how they use these elements to perform this feat. Starting with synchrotrons, which are giant, extremely expensive light sources. They work by accelerating electrons to near the speed of light, and then using these electrons to produce high energy electromagnetic radiation or light. This is achieved in a few steps. First, they admit electrons into a linear accelerator, which uses large electric fields to initially give these electrons a significant velocity. The electric field is produced by large capacitors, where the electron is attracted to the positive side and repelled by the negative. By oscillating the direction of the electric fields with the right timing, i.e. by changing the direction of the voltage applied to the capacitor, the electron can be made to accelerate significantly, giving it a large initial velocity. The electrons then go into a booster ring, where they are sped up even further before being injected into the storage ring. This is where all the magic happens. Once in the storage ring, the electrons that are now moving near the speed of light go through a series of magnets that are designed for different tasks. The main two that we need to know about are bending magnets and undulating magnets. Bending magnets do as their name suggests. They bend the electron beam around the corners of the synchrotron. As the electrons have a charge, when they change direction around the synchrotron, they emit light. For bending magnets, this is a large range of different wavelengths of X-ray radiation. Undulating magnets are a little different. They change direction constantly, forcing the electron to wiggle their way through. These magnets end up producing an extremely narrow beam of high intensity light. The light produced by the bending and undulating magnets is then sent down what is called beam lines that can be used for experiments. It is this light that scientists use to measure the shortest time. They needed to use these x-rays from the synchrotron because in order to perform the measurement, they needed a light source with a very specific energy. The scientists used this light and shot it to hydrogen molecules. They took these molecules and positioned them such that the light would hit one atom before the other. They also chose the energy of the light, such that there was just enough energy to give two electrons the energy they needed to escape the atoms that they were bound to. They then measured how long it took for each of these electrons to escape through measuring an interference pattern. So this is where the quantum mechanics comes into play. 
An interference pattern is what forms when two waves overlap with each other, making a constructive and destructive interference pattern. You may be familiar with Young's double slit experiment that showed that light does act as waves. Young achieved this by shining light through two slits and showing that there was an interference pattern that could be observed, which is only possible if the light was acting as a wave and not a particle. This same experiment works with electrons and larger atoms. The scientists knew the distance between the two slits. It was just the size of the hydrogen molecule. However, when they measured the interference pattern, they didn't see the same as the normal double slit experiment. This was because the second electron was emitted slightly later than the first. In fact, it was 247 septoseconds later. Well, it turns out that this delay in emission is the same as a phase shift, which results in a shift in the interference pattern. This means that you can measure the time delay between the two electrons being emitted simply by measuring the shift in the pattern. In this case, the time delay is just the time it took the light to travel from one side of the atom to the other. This type of technique could lead to detailed measuring of structure of complex molecules, but it does still need a little bit more development as this is some of the first measurements that we've seen. By using interference patterns, scientists could map out the structure of these molecules and potentially discover new things about these structures. While a lot of work is still to be done on exploring this technique, it's still an amazing feat. Thanks for watching, have fun, see you next time.